Hello, this is Barry from Blanchard Sound Library, part of the Fingal Network of Libraries. And we're joined again by Jill Barrett, uh, Executive Performance and Leadership Coach. And this is our fourth and final video in a series that we've done on resilience. Um, up until now, we've been looking at the many different aspects of resilience, and in particular, how we can develop our resource resilience. Um, which effectively helps us to build a toolkit to mentally manage whatever life throws at us and it's certainly throwing a lot at us at the moment. Um, so hello Jill. Hi Barry, how are you today? Very well, thank you and it's uh, thanks a million and I'm, I'm, I'm sad that we're doing our last video now but uh, I, I, I've, yeah. said, I've got a lot out of it and I'm sure everyone else has. Great, yeah. Um, I have to say I've really enjoyed doing them myself so um so yeah, sure. Hopefully, we might do a few more. Absolutely, and yeah, I think you, you, yep, absolutely, and on different topics as well. So, so what have you got for us today? Well, Barry, I suppose uh, everyone loves a top ten. So, um, I thought that today, both as a reminder of everything we covered in the last couple of episodes, um, and with a few extra things thrown into the mix, I might just suggest a few good practices, some practical things that people can do mm -hmm. to help build that um, resource resilience that you mentioned. So. Pouring a little bit of concrete, as I say, into the mm -hmm. foundations that we mentioned in uh, in episode two, and I suppose people might be saying, "Oh, top ten? Where am I going to get a time mm -hmm. to to do top ten? If I get two or three, I'll be lucky." Um, and to be honest, just do as many of these as as you're able. And what you might find as well is that you know you're doing a lot of them already. So it's really just about getting into these positive habits that help you to build that resilience. And as I said, the you know the resource resilience in particular. Um, so, you know, they always say, and this is with a, uh, you know, just for the, the vegans and the animal lovers out there, you know, this is just a metaphor. How do we eat an elephant? You know, in <laughs> tiny chunks. Um, so you don't attempt to do all 10 in one go if, if you're not used to doing these. You just literally, you know, take as many uh, at a time as you want. And you'll find that even if you do one or two a day uh, or one or two, uh, get you know, over a few days for a week, You'll get into the habit. You you'll build your your muscle in that in that area. Um, so, um, and I I meant to say as well, and I'm not sure if there's a function in in YouTube uh, mm -hmm. on your channel to do this, but if people have their own suggestions that you know the library community would benefit from, they should certainly you know drop a mail at them or drop a comment um, uh, on the on uh, the on the video. Absolutely, uh, yeah. On on our YouTube channel, which everyone should be subscribing to our new channel. And um, you can absolutely leave comments there, and we'd, we'd be delighted to hear any of any of the kind of our library users' ideas um, that they found useful. And the, and when we post this on Facebook and Twitter as well, please feel free to to give your contributions uh, in in the in the comment section. Fantastic. So, um, as people might have seen this image before, uh, and I love it. It's by a. A uh, photographer called, he's an Italian guy called Stefano Zocca, and he went up the mountains one day as he was wont to do with his son, actually. Um, so I think it was only seven or eight at the time. And he went up with the idea of, of um, snapping these, uh, they're called ibex, so they're like an, I, you know, a, uh, an alpine mountain goat. And these are the guys that climb, you know, right out of these rock faces to get them tastiest morsels of grass and I just thought this is just a, a fabulous image I mean you've seen probably loads of them in a lifetime but imagine this guy where he is he's you know balancing teetering on the edge of a tiny you know tiny little piece of rock that he's climbed around on to that's on the edge of a ravine in the middle of a mountain range and and look at him he just looks so calm you know um, and of course this is a bit like our notion of robust resilience that we covered in week one, that sometimes people do these things, you know, to, to mm -hmm. test themselves and to build their resilience, but we don't recommend that. But we don't know that at some point in our lives, we won't end up on a ledge just like this. And we would love to be like this goat, I think, wouldn't we? Barry, we'd like yeah, to be nice, sort of nice and calm and in control, in a difficult yeah. situation mm -hmm. and just go, do you know what? I'm okay. Do you know, I've got this. Um, you know, so, so that, that, that uh, image, I think, captures lovely what we're trying to do here. We're trying to be like the goat, which in any sort of challenging situation is just able to balance here effortlessly. That, calm, that, that can be our slogan, Jill, by the end, be like the goat. That, that can be our... <laughs> be like the goat. Be like, be like the goat. Um, 
So the first of our top 10 is, um, and you're going to be metacognition out at this stage now, Barry, we've mentioned this every week. <laughs> Um, it's, it's the first piece of it is an awareness. The second piece is uh, the metacognition. So thinking about our thinking. For those of uh, you who are listening and watching who haven't um, seen previous episodes, and hopefully you'll tune into those as well, um, it's a twofold piece um, around emotional intelligence. So the first is becoming aware of the fact that we have thoughts all the time, some that serve us, some that don't. Uh, and the second is once you're aware that you're having those thoughts, um, you know, starting to question them because obviously being aware of them, we become aware of the thought itself and uh, we become aware of the emotion associated with it, the physiology that brings uh, on it uh, on in us um, and consequently, you know, how we behave accordingly. So it, it gets into a cycle. Um, and secondly, the second piece of that emotional intelligence piece after the awareness is that reflection piece on the thinking. So the reflection is the metacognition, imagining maybe perhaps that we're like a drone looking down at our thoughts, looking mm -hmm. down at the effect that our thoughts have on us, um, and, and consequently what we're doing, you know, as a result of that. So, so starting to think about that, doing that betting piece, um, and fact checking, okay? Mm -hmm. So we, we talk about perception and fact, or perception and, and reality. And we're all familiar now with the phrase, sadly, um, through... American media and politics, you know, and social media, is it a true fact? You know, we should never be asking, is it a true fact? But, but what's peddled now as facts often isn't. So, but in, in the case of your own thoughts, is it a fact? And is it, is it a true fact, which is a scientifically incontrovertible truth? No way that this can be, um, you know, contradicted. And I mentioned before that lovely lady, Byron Katie, who has done a load of great work around this. So the question is always, if what I'm thinking is not a fact, you know, what was I about to do on the basis of that thought? You know, what, what was going to happen? Um, because if I get into that habit, then it allows me to catch them. It allows that moment to pause and that will bolster my, help to bolster my self-worth, my self-regard, my self-esteem, you know, my resilience, my relationships. Um, I was doing a meditation once with a guy called Barry Lee. Barry's lovely. He works with the Sanctuary, Sisters Dance Sanctuary in Dublin. And he just invited us in the middle of meditation. He said, you know, how much of our thinking um, and our, our life is spent, you know, planning, so going forward, um, looking back, you know, reliving things, you know, reliving that conversation mm -hmm, that you mm -hmm, had, mm -hmm. you know, with your child or with a parent or but from, I, I, over and over from and over six again, years ago, you know, yeah. just on <laughs> Years ago, yeah, yeah. days ago, months, minutes ago, weeks ago, years mm -hmm. ago. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's incredible, isn't it? Yeah. It's all in there. Um, and, and judging ourselves. So much of our time is spent. And like we all do it, you know. We're at the cash desk. I mean, we could go to the cash desk. Uh, or we're online and somebody is taking their time to get through a point and they're going, oh, God, yeah, they're so, uh, you know, they're not so, you know. And then we start ourselves, oh, my God, I'm, I look terrible. I'm, oh, God, I, I, I stumbled over a phrase there. You know, so we're beating ourselves up useless really to us in terms of building that resilience so uh, a chance to step back look at what we're saying and scrap it attitude is the is the next piece okay so in our our, our top 10 um attitude and we we hear of that phrase an attitude of gratitude and that's a really useful attitude to develop because it's really hard to be angry or irritated with somebody and be grateful at the same time it's quite difficult um you know it's like smiling or laughing and trying to be down in that mm -hmm. moment, you know, it's, it's, it, it tricks the brain. So questioning, what sort of attitude have I got? What's my default, you know? And a useful practice to boost your resilience daily can be to write down the 10 things that you're, you're grateful for. So are you grateful or are you resentful? Are you negative? Are you, is your glass always half in that a path full? And I love to do my gratitude journaling every night before I go to sleep. And I always write down at least 10 things I can think about. Now, I just, I go from 10, unless I'm falling asleep, it, it can't become 20 or 25. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be something really, you know, mind-blowingly huge that happened during the day. It could be something tiny. The sun was shining. The sun was shining for an hour. Um, you know, my cousin sent me a funny thing on WhatsApp. Um, I have less pain today. Whatever mm -hmm. happens to be. And if you can't manage 10, start with two or three build it up that way. The most important thing is getting into the habit of doing it. Okay? 
the more we do it, the more grateful we are, the more settled and relaxed we become in ourselves because, you know, it reminds us of all the good things that are happening instead of getting caught up in all the negative. Mm -hmm. um, and remember, attitude or gratitude is just one aspect of attitude. I mean, it could be that you decide to develop an attitude of perseverance. You know, I'm going to stick with this. I'm going to stick with things that are difficult. Uh, openness, you know, to be open to challenge or difference, positivity. So, so how are you going to adjust for the better? And remember, just we we spoke before about uh, emotions being contagious. Remember as well that your attitude is contagious. So if you come in feeling grumpy and you know you're just giving out, you're moaning, and even before you say anything, we spoke about this before. You're creating this oh atmosphere. Other mm -hmm. people pick up that on that as well, don't they? So they uh, they go into that mode. The third piece. For me, is affirmations. Now, a lot of people dis affirmations because they're said to be fluffy or, you know, oh, you know, it's too airy fairy, it's too happy clappy. Um, they were popularized by this lady, Dr. Susan Jeffers. You know, this book people might have heard of it. Feel the fear and do it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but I love them, and the reason I love them is because they get you into a real, a really positive space. You know, uh, they build a positive platform for you to stand on, so that all the other you know, things that are going on that might not be so lovely around you will look a little less grey and a little less black if you can try and get your mind into that positive space. So um, so for years, all we had were anecdotes. And of course, the multiple of anecdotes is not data. But now we do have data because we can look at brain imaging and we can see that, yes, if you engage in these affirmations, with these affirmations, that brain, your brain does change for the better. Okay. So, um, and there's these two guys, I don't know where, um, you've heard of them, uh, Logal and Cohen, and they did lots of research to show that, um, you know, affirmations do help us to perceive otherwise threatening messages with less resistance and to, to respond in more positive ways. So that when we face those challenges, you know, having engaged in that practice of affirmations, you know, I'm more likely to be more robust when the challenge is facing. So, so again, it's about that positive psych, uh, psychology piece and to make them real. So a lot of people dis affirmations because they say when well, your brain doesn't believe them. Um, so they say make them personal. So use the personal profile pronoun I if you can. Mm -hmm. um, use good action verbs. Make sure they're stated in the present tense. You know, and they're grounded in realism because your your brain is not going to buy it if you tell it porkies. You know, it's it's. If you try and tell it everything is fantastic today and inside you know that just the situation facing you is not well that's 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 going to be a difficult one for the brain to process so what you want to do is make sure that you give a nod to the reality of the situation when you're when you're doing your affirmations but i also think as well if you add in a little bit of humor then even if it's not strictly true your brain will go with it a little Mm -hmm. So um, the most basic one I learned to do, and I find it really funny, especially at the moment, because I wake up in the morning and go, oh, my God, I look in the mirror and I go, Jesus, I haven't seen a hairdresser now in three months, three and a half months. <laughs> yeah, well, look, um, yeah. Oh, look. Yeah. <laughs> the lockdown yeah, you, you beard. You do your yeah. own colour there too, Barry, mm -hmm. I see. <laughs> so I'm doing my own colour and uh, I can't cut my hair. Um, somebody offered to mm -hmm. lend me a hairdressing scissors, you know, and I said, no chance. But... Mm -hmm. um, so I might be thinking, look, I'm looking a bit ropey today, but I will look in the mirror and I will give myself a wink and I go, do you know what, you're looking hot today. Do you know, because it'll just lighten the mood. It'll take that sting out of it. And I'll just start to feel a little better about myself. There's no, nothing right. wrong with that. Absolutely, you know? yeah. um, or if the day is going really badly, you might say, look, I'm having a really tough day today. But you know what? I'm doing the best that I can and I'm going to get through it. It's a tough day, but I'm doing the best that I can and I'm going to get through it. And the key with these affirmations is to repeat them so they become a habit, so that those lovely new neural pathways are formed, okay? So that they say to form a habit, you're supposed to do it for 30 days. I don't really know how long it actually takes. I always say just keep going at it until it becomes the norm for you, until it's bedded in. So for me, it's 30 times a day, three times a day for 30 days for it to bed in. For other people, it might be different. Just give it a go and you see what works. And develop a few of them. You know, so, um, you know, that you have a, a, if you like, a toolbox to them. And the fourth piece then is mindfulness and meditation. I won't go into this too much, Barry, because I know you've done a whole piece with Rita, uh, Rita O'Donovan on that. So I was just wondering if you'd like to sort of speak to that for a moment. Yeah. Just for the people who mightn't have seen. <clears throat> 
what you did with Rita. First of all, I'd encourage everyone to have a look. Um, we did a two-part series with Rita O'Donovan, specifically on mindfulness. And, and what struck me is there's a huge overlap between what you're doing and what Rita's doing, um, which is fascinating. And I suppose one of the main points Rita was making, and it brings us back to the, the first of our top 10 practices here, our awareness and metacognition, that mindfulness is really about awareness and, and listening, uh, as, as Rita said, listening to your body and listening to what it's telling you. And maybe if you're, you're not feeling too well or you're stressed or you're feeling anxious, that you're actually aware of it. And you can catch yourself and actually as you said then in, in the last one and say yeah i'm having a bad day but at least i'm aware of it and i'm, I'm sure you've heard of john yeah. kabat zinn who's like one of the, the fathers of yeah. mindfulness in, in the west anyway and i mean he often yeah. said like if you're having a, a day and you say well it's going to hell in a handbasket well at least i'm aware it is <laughs> i said yeah. where do we go from here now and then the other point Rita made, which I think links in very much with what you've been saying to us, is that often when we have a stimulus, something that happens, like I'm having a stimulus now, there's an alarm gone off in my uh, <laughs> kitchen. And you know what? That's okay. That's, that's part of working from home. That's, I think it's just the dishwasher. No, it's just the dishwasher going off. So. <laughs> but there's, an, there's a stimulus and, and I could get stressed or I could just laugh at it. So we, we laugh at it. And um, she made the point that when there is some kind of a stimulus, often a stressful one, um, we often, as you said, react. And if we can just take that moment to pause, as you said, and, res and, and respond to it rather than react. And, and the, what occupies that space between stimulus and response is hopefully mindfulness. And if we can take those few seconds to just be mindful of the situation, think, okay, what, as you said, what's actually happening here? What are the facts? What's yeah. true? What's but, not true? Yeah. Take that deep breath and then respond to the situation. Whereas we, we tend to react quickly, don't we, to things. And that's where the mindfulness came in. And I'll just say, in the last session I did with Rita, there's a wonderful body scan exercise in there that I'd advise everyone to have a go at. And I, I see it like a training exercise. It's training you to listen to your body and to be aware of your body, what's going on, your breath, your muscles, tension, thoughts, all that type of thing. And just, just be aware of it. And then once that's, to me, that's half the battle. Once we're aware, whether it be good or, or bad or, or just it is what it is, then, then we can we can respond appropriately. Fantastic. Yeah, and you, you've nailed it there in terms of, of, of summing that up. And um, that, that being in the present moment, I mean, just the mindfulness and meditation is just being right here, right now, you know, with, with what's happening and, and getting getting a bit comfortable with that, even though it's as difficult as that, as that might, might sound. Um, and I know I came to it myself. I mean, I was doing mindfulness and meditation for years, I thought, and then I realized, oh, I'm not, I haven't been doing it at all. Um, and, I, and it was just uh, what, what brought it home to me was one morning in 2017, um, or rather not 2017, it was last year. Uh, but in 2017, I had a load of bereavements. Really, I had an accident myself. I slipped and fell on some stairs. Um, and then a month later, my sister also fell on some stairs but she wasn't so lucky she didn't survive she hit her head she died and then in September a really good friend of mine died of cancer and then in um, later in September my best friend since I was four dropped dead and it, it was just all these things happening in one year and mm. I was so busy at the time and the year which followed I didn't grieve at all I just felt like I was grieving but I was uh, you know just coping 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 working 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 and then eventually the beginning of last year things started to quiet down and I remember one morning my NCT not able to find my vehicle licensing certificate I thought I had looked in the, you know, the box that it was always in it wasn't there and within the space of 20 minutes I had gone from not zero to a hundred I had gone from zero to a thousand mm. and I nearly lost my mind with what was going on in my head I was giving out to myself all the time I was nearly in tears yeah. uh, my NCT was like that morning usually I'd have left it out the night before I was beating myself up over that and then I just stopped and I thought, go back to the box. And I went back to the box and it was in between two pieces of paper. And it was just a real wake up call to me to see what had happened to me in that 20 minutes. So that's mm. when I started practicing mindfulness. So within mm. three or four weeks, I noticed a complete difference in my stress response. Like, you know, couldn't find something or 
couldn't think of something and I'd go, well, wait a minute, you know, where was it last or... Mm. And, if and you think logically about it, it'll come to you. And it's often and it something so, small, isn't it, that sets us off like that? It can be the most minor thing. Absolutely, but that was not resilient to me. That was the very opposite to resilient to me. That mm. was me in complete fight or flight crease, yeah, you know, yeah, that, yeah. that, that stress response. And you mentioned um, at the end of, of that video about that body scan, which is great. If anybody hasn't done mindfulness before, definitely to check that out. And also the one I did was a thing called Mindfulness Daily on soundstrue.com, which is just 40 days of practice. And you might think that's very onerous. It's a little more than 10 minutes a day. They say it's 15 minutes, it's a little more than 10 minutes a day. And it was a lifesaver for me, an absolute out and out lifesaver. So definitely mindfulness and meditation. So thanks Barry for the, the insight into that from your own perspective as well. So so number five um, is conscious of our time. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking about uh, my, my old teacher, one of these teachers, sometimes they said things to you to encourage you and other times to beat you down in life. But uh, I just found this one really useful. He used to just say rubbish in, rubbish out. So whether it's what you're reading, what you're thinking, and in this case, what you're eating, um, it really is true. And so if we're eating lots of processed foods and for processed we packaged, um, you've got all these chemicals, additives going into your system. Your body has enough to be doing immune system is fighting off bacteria in your own body, never mind the stuff that you're putting into it, and all of the things that are going on. So if we give it extra stress by putting all those additives and, and chemicals in from those packaged and processed foods, we're just giving it an extra job to do physically, and therefore, in terms of resilience, you're not going to be mentally, there's not going to be any reserves left, because your body, when, in, in, when it's really, really stressed, what your body does is it sends all its efforts to the essential organs. Okay, to keep you alive, your heart, your lungs, your kidneys, whatever, and it takes it away from the other things, <laughs> you know, like calming you down. Mm -hmm. you no, know, it just goes straight into to keeping you alive in that moment. So it's constantly battling. So we want to put in nice, good food. So I always say, if your green bin, or not your green bin, your brown bin is filling up, and there's not much in your or black, it's a good sign because it means there's less packaging there, mm -hmm. and there's more whole foods um, and natural foods going in. And remember as well in terms of hydration, so people just think about the eating, the drinking is absolutely key, not the alcohol. Um, the odd glass of wine, of course, can help, depending on your scenario, but uh, water is essential. So 75% of our brains are water. And the brain doesn't actually, and the body doesn't actually recognize dehydration for some reason until long after it's mm -hmm. set in. So, and even, um, you know, these guys from loads of different universities, University of Connecticut, John Hopkins University, loads of research there to show that even a small amount of dehydration can cause brain fog. Um, you know, what going, what's going into your gut can cause uh, you to have pain, obviously inflama inflammatory disorders, depression, not deal with stress at all well, you know, um, mood changes, you name it, it's there. Mm -hmm. So it's a huge incentive to us to just make sure that you're eating well and cutting down on sugar as well, with, which you know yourself is key. With, with Jill, and I'm Jill, really I, shocked. I, I, I'll just come in on that and just say, I, I, from personal experience, what you're saying is absolutely true. I, I recently, well, at the beginning of this year, decided it was time to, to kind of get my act together on the diet. And, and, and I had a, a very good reason. That I, I found out I was I had type two diabetes and I kind of suspected it for a while, and you're absolutely right because when I changed my diet to a healthier diet, cut out the sugar, cut out the the processed food, the difference I found in obviously my physical well-being, not only weight loss but in terms of digestion, but also my mood was up, my sleep was better, my energy levels were higher. So. You're absolutely right, and one of the best pieces of advice I was given, you spoke about the green bin there, which is a great, great way of thinking about it, was... Um, brown guy, bin. That's yeah. the brown bin, yeah. The, the, a guy called James D Dignam, I think, does uh, kind of books about healthy eating. And he said, if it didn't uh, walk, run, fly, swim, or get pulled out of the ground, <laughs> don't eat it. <laughs> yes, I know. And we're so lucky in Ireland because we have so much of that stuff, particularly in the current environment, available to us, you know, whereas in other countries, they, they don't. 
Um, and it's a great point about the type 2 diabetes because we know that particular type of diabetes can be totally controlled with mm. diet and exercise, yeah. which is just yeah. amazing. Uh, not, not a tablet, yeah. Yeah. Not to say, you yeah. know, if, if you get on top of it. Um, and and I, I, I was just thinking that I was at a financial planning seminar recently and I was just shocked by the statistic the guys gave, which was that um, it's from health insurance companies, that 83% of hospital admissions, uh, or you know, even for procedures, whatever, are lifestyle related. Yeah. So only 17% are related to congenital or you know, mm -hmm. genetic defects mm -hmm. of somebody. The rest are all to do with what we're eating uh, or not eating and how we're exercising or not and all of that. So it's, it's, it's quite an extraordinary statistic. Mm -hmm. uh, so moving on, we have a friend movement. And I prefer this word to exercise because uh, when we mention exercise, people, some people coil up and go, oh my God, oh my God, such an effort. And, uh, they think of gyms and, you know, yes. guys pumping or girls pumping iron, um, you know, and uh, or virtually at home now with Joe Wicks, you know, doing the 20-minute mm -hmm. workout, you know, do you want to lose 20 pounds or 30 pounds or what, what do you want to lose? Um, but to me, exercise can be anything we want, as long as it's movement, as long as it's in the heart beating, and the, ling the lungs filling with oxygen, that's the main thing, okay? So, um, and there's just so much research in terms of the release of endorphins, you know, reducing stress, reducing tension, building your energy levels, all the lovely things that you mentioned there um, in terms of the eating as well. And it only becomes a chore if it's difficult for us to do, so if we make it hard for us to do by making it inconvenient, or it's just something we don't enjoy. So just, yeah. if you don't enjoy it, just don't do it. It's like like anything in life. If you could possibly avoid it, mm -hmm. if you mm -hmm. don't enjoy it, just just don't do it. Um, you know. So make something. Do something that you want to do. For me, um, I can't really run anymore because I have a couple of health uh, issues. But I I can walk, and I walk if I can a couple of times a day. And we were talking earlier. I haven't got out for my walk today, and I really feel it. Um, mm -hmm. You know. So walking is known to be as beneficial for running. And if your movement is really limited, so you might have a disability or you might, you know, just feel I'm getting older and I can't do as much as I could or you've got an injury, then any sort of movement. So if I'm just stretching out my hands here and contracting my hands, I am moving all of the muscles in my forearms right up to my shoulders and in my hands. And that's burning fat. Okay, it's burning fat. It's using up energy. It's getting my heart beating a little bit faster. Or if I'm just even... I don't have the use of, of my hands. Just stomp your feet. Just stomp your feet. Whatever part of your body moves, move it, basically. You know, um, and getting outdoors as well can be really beneficial. This year. If you're not able to do that, getting outdoors in nature, mm -hmm. uh, preferably. Um, but getting outdoors, you know, somewhere where there might be a couple of trees to a local park, if you're living in an apartment or whatever. So, so um, try and get out as much as possible. But every movement will bring you benefit. Um, in terms of number seven, then music would be the next one for me. And um, we were talking about, the, never mind the top ten practices for resilience, the top ten of the 80s. Uh, or that's us showing our age. Yes, there. yes, uh, I think so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so you know, you don't have to be a musician or a singer for this for this tip. Um, you know, the very act of listening to music mm -hmm. just has mm -hmm. so many um, beneficial effects. And one of the loveliest things I discovered over the years is this. Uh, crew in the University of um, Central Florida, UCF, and if anybody gets a chance, look up the Pegasus magazine, and um, there's an article on it um, showing the effects of music on the brain, and these two professors, um, you know, Sugaya and Yonatani, Sugaya was a neuroscientist, and Yonatani is a violinist, and they have a fantastic course called Music and the Brain, and it explores, you know, how music um, impacts, oh, I just rolled on there, didn't it? Um, <laughs> how music impacts the brain function. Um, so, you know, talking about, again, that reducing stress, reducing pain, reducing depression uh, symptoms, improving your cognitive skills. And we mentioned before the plasticity of the brain. So it actually helps to build those new neural pathways, you know, that, that we mentioned. Um, and of course, we know um, from sort of, I suppose, pop culture over the years that uh, classical music has mm -hmm. been used uh, where there are sort of antisocial behavior black spots, like for example, the tube stations or bus stations, to reduce the amount successfully, to reduce the amount of antisocial behavior. Um, and we might be familiar as well with the Mozart effect, 
where our listening hosts are has been improved uh, with uh, you know uh, patients to reduce blood pressure and reduce heart rate. And um, mm. so, I mean, what's what's not to love about that? You know, and mm. and obviously, this fear center in our brain is called the amygdala. And listening to any music, and especially classical music, okay. um, helps to calm that. So mm. the fear center is the amygdala, and calming the fear center okay. is is key. Um, well, well I have some good news on that one, and I'll do a little plug here, is that with oh, your right. Fingal library account, you can access free Gaul music, and you have access to hundreds of thousands of, uh, of tracks, including all the classical music you could want, and with your library card, completely free, so people can use that now to get in and listen to their, their Mozart in the evening, and... Fantastic. Know, a nice relaxing great. I, I didn't know that resource was there, there so thanks go. Barry, that's and great. Completely great. Free. great to know. Yeah. So so number eight then, uh, my number eight, and we're coming up to, to the last couple, um, is um, writing or journaling. And what we know from research is that whether you're writing down, you know, if you've gone through bad times or are going through bad times, whether you're writing down stuff that is you might perceive to be negative, or you're writing down the nice stuff like the gratitude journal I was talking about earlier. That it's all beneficial because it enables you to be more self-aware, more self-reflective, um, and to separate your thinking, okay, um, from yourself, okay. Mm -hmm. So sort of putting your thoughts out there, um, and if you like the written word, as I do, as opposed to the typed word, um, I think it's really useful. A tiny little notebook. I always have millions of notebooks in my house, um, and just carry one with you and and just get into the habit of it. Um, there's a guy called James Pennebaker, you know, he's a social psychologist and he was sort of the pioneer of research into um, the benefits of writing and writing in therapy. Um, and like that, with all of the other pieces that we've mentioned there today, you know, it helps you to just separate thoughts from the, from the body and the head. Um, labeling emotions is, is the key in it as well, due to when you're acknowledging things, so you're actually just getting them out there because otherwise they're staying in this torrent in the brain. Um, and just acknowledging that fact of acknowledging is important and also it helps us to organize the events that are happening or have happened okay so it improves our working memory because it's taking the clutter out of our head and it's just putting it here on paper you know and um, so there's less clutter and that you know enables us to sleep better which builds our immune function um, and you know improves our mood so that so makes us more resilient to life's knocks you know I mean we know that we're, you know, when we're overwhelmed, it's just everything can become just too difficult, you know. And we know the terrible, you know, tragedies that can happen when people just get into that that rut and that spin. So, mm -hmm. so I journal regularly, and if something is becoming overwhelming, or I sense, uh, I tend to stockpile my worries. I'm not sure about you, Barry, but uh, I tend to forget that things are worrying me, even though I know that they are, and they build up, and eventually, oh, I just get, oh God, what's happening? And then I thought, okay, I need to think about this. Write them all down. So I just have a little audit sheet, and I give headings. And my headings are, what's happening? How am I feeling about it? You know, so name the emotion. So just stating what's happening. How am I feeling about it? What's the emotion? Is it important? As in, is this something I really need to be worrying about? Sometimes I'm just on the loop here. Um, if it's not important, dump it. Line through it. Forget about it. Let it go. The end. If it is important, then what can I do about it? Okay, so that's the next setting. What can I do about it? If it is important, what can I do about it? Um, if anything, and again, if I can't do anything, back to our control influence, except do I have to accept it? But is there another possibility? Is there somebody else that can help or support me in dealing with this particular scenario? Okay, so, so again, those headings, what's happening? How am I feeling about it? Is it important? If it is important, what can I do about it? If anything, um, who might help me on this? You know, so so uh, I like that little audit sheet because it helps me to to get on top of things when I'm, you know, when I'm I'm overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. uh, rest, second last one, um, is my rest piece. So, a lady called Ariana Huffington. She's a very wealthy lady. She owns the Huff Post. She's connected to mm -hmm. Yahoo and um, you know Rise and all those 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 company names we hear. Um, and she had a really bad accident in 2007 she just uh, woke up on her floor at home she'd been reading emails and uh, surrounded with blood blood everywhere um, and she had what experienced what could have been a, a really serious uh, life-threatening life-changing head injury she had collapsed and banged her head 
Uh, fortunately, she only fortunately she only broke her jaw and nearly knocked her eye out, uh, but it could have been much worse. And she just realised she had collapsed from exhaustion. You know, mm. so something for people to be really aware of at the moment. You know, um, we're eight, nine weeks, whatever it is into sort of a, a, a crisis phase in this, and we're coming out the other side. But people are exhausted at home with kids, homeschooling, juggling. You know. You are saying yeah, there yourself, yeah. there's an alarm going off in the kitchen, yeah, there's yeah, a you know, yeah. little child in another room with your partner or your wife. Yeah, and, and, your... and I think as well that the, a lot of people have worried a lot over the last few weeks, I certainly have, about yeah. childcare and this. And that's yeah. exhausting, isn't it? It's exhausting. It is exhausting. So that sleep piece, you know, if the kids are going to sleep a little bit early in the morning, if they have a nap during the day, like you have a nap, so, do you know what I mean? <laughs> Do what you can and get, you know, with the sleep that you can. And, and don't don't waste time doing the silly stuff, you know what I mean, that you could usefully spend resting or sleeping, you know. So you've got an extra bit of dust in the house or you didn't vacuum this week or, like, who, who cares, really, except for you. Do, do you know what I mean? Go off and have a nap. Give yourself a massage if there's nobody to give you a, <laughs> a massage. You know, take a little bit of downtime, you know, sneak into the bathroom and just run a bath. Do you know, whatever it happens to be, just the rest and the sleep is really important. If you can get your eight hours, wonderful. If you can't, anything. And Deepak Chopra, um, I know once myself, probably during that year, I was I was just going through a phase of having difficulty sleeping. And if I had a big job on or something the next day, especially, and he just had a lovely meditation. And he's just talking you through and he's going, look, do you know what? If you're not able to sleep, don't worry about it. The fact that you're just lying there resting with your eyes closed is nearly as good. It's not a, of course, it's not as good. Not exactly the same. But it, and once I actually heard those words, and I kept saying that to myself, sure, I go off to sleep. Mm. Do you know? Because uh, this, the, I was I was getting as stressed about my not sleeping as I was just being stressed, which was impeding my sleep. So. That's uh, something Rita O'Donovan brought up as well as is being compassionate towards yourself, of course. You yes. know, we, we, we were often, as you said, again, we were most critical, aren't we, of ourselves and you we know, are, of course. to be, be nice are, to ourselves, <laughs> to remember yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, so a little bit of metacognition in the middle of the night. What's happening here? What am I saying to myself? Is it useful? No, just let it go. You know, so. But um, coming back to the sleep piece, just again, creating a nest for yourself if you can. So, you know, you can read up all you like on this in terms of gadgets out of the room and a nice space and the right temperature and all that just to, to give yourself quality sleep where you can. And the last piece then, and this is really the most important because without this one, everything else falls to pieces. Unfortunately, it does. So I always say D is the dirty word, uh, you know, that uh, D is for discipline. Um, you know, and I've mentioned this guy, Tony Robbins before. And he talks about these rituals um, and, and rituals, you know, are attached, discipline is attached to rituals. The fact that you are carrying out rituals is a discipline in itself. It is a discipline. Um, so the saying goes, the way we do anything is the way we do everything. You know, the way we do anything is the way we do everything. So just think about that for a moment and think of yourself. And you're, that just means what's my default way of being? Mm. Am I running around like a headless chicken? Am I panicking at the slightest hint of you know, trouble, or am I just in a calm space and going, this too shall pass, you know, what's my mode? So we all have rituals, you know, some serve to boost us and boost our resilience, and some just don't, you know, they stop us being the decent human beings mm -hmm. we are capable of being and want to be, um, and, and they stop us being kind to ourselves and to others, you know. Um, so we always say, again, Google is listening, so is your mind. You know, your mind is listening to everything that you say, everything that you think. And the more you do of one, the positive stuff, mm -hmm. the stronger that part of the brain becomes and those neural connections come, and the more you do it the other, likewise. So it's all a question of the discipline, how do I want to spend my time? So I mentioned before, first we form habits, and then a habit form us. And one of the first psychology books I remember ever buying myself was Stop Thinking, Start Doing, because mm -hmm. I was a thinker. I was a ruminator. <laughs> I was either always thinking about things that had happened in the past, past or I was worrying about things that were going to happen in the future. I think, I think a lot of us can, 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 can empathize with that. I think we all, we all do that to some extent, don't we? <laughs> we do, we do. And sometimes it's okay, we can let it run. It's just as you say, that lack of awareness happens and then, sure, days, months, weeks have passed. And... Uh, 
Um, so I, I have a little line for myself, which is the Nike tagline, which is just do it, just do it. You know, unless there's some sort of dreadful consequence to my doing it, just get on with it, Jill. Like just, just get it, you know, get stuck in. Um, and so discipline is your good rituals repeated over and over and over again. Okay, that's all discipline is, you know. use and it's to build your resilience you'll be doing the good stuff not the bad stuff not the stuff that doesn't serve you the good stuff all the things we've mentioned and anything else you want to think of um because that will bring lasting change it will shore up your resources um so that nothing and no one can top of you and i think that's a, a fantastic place to to finish out and, and today i mean there there are 10 really practical uh tips i think that we can all use and as you said don't, don't try to do them all at once. You can if you want, but maybe take one or two and, and, and have a go with them. And I'd encourage anyone who hasn't seen the rest of the series, um, there is a, a playlist on our YouTube channel with all four episodes. Um, and they're short. I think we went a bit longer today. I think we had a lot to say, but most of them are around 20, 25 minutes and uh, fantastic uh, information there. So Jill, all the you know is left is for me to say thank you for today and also for the last uh, few weeks i've enjoyed speaking to you i've learned a lot myself and i'm sure a lot of people um who are listening and watching will, will get a huge amount of, uh, out of what you've you've told us in the last few weeks yeah thanks Barry, and thanks for all your great insights as well and inputs it really added to uh, to my enjoyment of the piece as well so thank you and i've, I've learned a lot from you too Thanks. And, and Jill, you, you are going to be back with us in, in the coming weeks um, looking at other personal development topics, I, I know, possibly linked to the Work Matter Centre in, in Fingal Libraries or, or other initiatives that we have. So to just keep an eye out on our Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram channels. We, we'll have information about them as soon as we, we, have, uh, we have something more concrete planned. So thanks, Barry. Okay, thank you, Jill.